Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO The Lasses of Europe in which we're playing as uh, Amalon, the final moments. The frozen tundra of the Siberian north is a desolate place, it's cold, deep, biting cold that you can feel in the marrow of your uh, big old bones. It's a frozen landscape of endless wide, broken up with frost covered trees jutting up icicles. As far as the eye can see, it is quiet. The birds do not sing here and the animals that do reside within these ice blasted woods are dangerous hunters. Hearing them would be the last thing you'd ever do. You don't know. What compelled you to come into these wastes? Was it a desire to escape your meaningless life? A more base desire, perhaps? One out of seeking food or water? Maybe you decided just to leave one day and never return. It is meaningless. Siberia called and you dying to answer. Regardless of your reasoning, you have been wandering for quite some time. You do not know where you are or how long it has been. All It has all been melded together in your eyes, the landscape seemingly without end. You don't know how long it's been since your water skin has gone dry, or nor how long you've gone without a proper meal. Finally overwhelmed with the burdens of reality, you fall to the ground. Wait, what the F is that? Is that a pony? If I get closer and learn the truth, death is preferable to whatever this nun says. Learn the truth in the endless tundra. I'm fleeing Moscow. I escape out of the back as things collapse around the, along the front. I am standing before a bonfire. I burn what few documents I have that identify me. That mark my failure. I am turning away when I see it. The crystal it glitters among the flames. I crouch, putting forth a trembling hand, feeling my body warp and transfigure the touch. As pain grips me, in reality collapses. I find my shame dissipate. I realize I know how to save Russia. I have the answer to my country's questions. It is an answer that no one will expect. As I do have a cup of coffee here. And we're just enjoying ourselves with a land of worker-directed uh, economy. Our supplies are looking pretty good. We actually have some growth here in the wasteland, too. Anything else? Max it out. Lower that as much as possible. We have terrible credit rating. Debt to GDP ratio is 0%, which is fine by me. Um, and actually, we have three factories. Or three consumer goods, or production units, I guess I should really say. Uh, so overall, not bad. Not bad. The Metamorphosis. Nikolai Bukharin's first thought was that he was dead. It was not the first time he felt this way. Life since the Great Patriotic War had been one of endless calamities of loss and suffering. In the years since his secret exile to Siberia, he'd narrowly avoided many deaths. It was only logical that his luck had finally run out, that he'd succumbed like so many before him. But if he was dead, why was he so giddy? Why could he still feel the roar of the fire and the gentle touch of snow? Why did his body feel so strange? Bukharin tried to think. He could remember shivering and lighting the bonfire. He could remember the gleam of some rock or gem among the coals, its glow otherworldly. He tried to grab it, to understand only for pain, agony, the slothing of his skin and warping of bone. He might have screamed too if it was not for the vision. Amid the pain, he'd seen a world unlike he'd ever known. He'd seen a society of creatures, happy and harmonious, free and equal, unburdened by suffering. They lived together as equals, as allies, as friends. These strange beings, trotting around and dressed in t bright technicolor, existed in a society more perfect than any dictatorship of the proletariat could create. Bukharin felt himself giggle in a high-pitched voice he didn't recognize. He opened his enormous eyes and rose in all four of his hooves. He stood there before a smoldering heat until he got sight of the crystal still there among the coals and the strange creature reflected in it. Without understanding why, he exclaimed, Oh boy! A pony! Reports have filtered down from the Great Farm from the northernmost communities in Siberia for the region so sparse populated news. Emerging from the region uh, at all is a shock. Even more shocking in the contents of these rumors. Wow, Nikolai looks great. Apparently, the communities of Amalon have been taken over by a talking horse, and not just any horse, but a unicorn. They claim the creature leads a government preaching communism and harmony, and the stallion claims to be named Nikolai Bukharin. Several experts on Russian affairs have chalked it up to mass hysteria, but locals claim it's all the truth. The journalist remembers this when paper, this when this paper was a reputable news source. Yeah, right, I'll believe it when I see it. Wow. Friendship is magic. Portrait by neither, from the Equestria War Team. And if you didn't know, this is the uh, Easter Egg, basically, path for... Old World Blues. Uh, Old World Blues. Why say Old World Blues? Equestria War and TNO when they did their thing, so awesome. A pink wind in the far north. <clears throat> sure, I look a little different. After having my entire being warped in ways that are impossible to conceive, I think differently too. It's not all bad, though. In this form, I feel a new energy coursing through me. I'm more determined than ever to help every pony in Russia. No matter how loud they scream or how fast they run away when they see me. The man they knew as Bukharin is dead. From the ashes of his failure, the stallion Bukharin rises. I will wrest victory from the talons of defeat. I will bring harmony to all the poor uh, trod upon peoples of the former Soviet Union. The world will soon see what Russians can accomplish when we work together. Uh, and add an infant ideology. Ooh, that did not look good. <clears throat> Rally the old guard. Convincing new leaders. Ooh. Let's try that one. Rally the old guard. In the vanishing part of my mind that still remembers what it was like to be a man, I sometimes remember my great friends in the presidium. Molotov, Rykov, Tomsky. We thought we'd figure out everything in those days. We figured we could use a revolutionary vanguard party to provide the working classes with the political consciousness that needed to dispose capitalism. 
Turns out that's all bunk. What you need for the successful overthrow of capitalism is not Leninist revolutionary leadership, but friendship. Lots of friendship. It's essential that I track down my closest surviving allies and tell them of this fact to demonstrate the newest evolution of Marxist thinking. The skeptics might cause de deviationists, but will show harmonic communism is a future. Huh. <coughs> communism, socialism, social democracy. And look a gift horse in the mouth. When Anatoly, a young researcher working with his fellow colleagues in the area to, to do what little he could to keep the light of science alive in the Russian anarchy, went out to hunt for food to put on for put on his table for the night, it had been sunny and clear. When he got hold of the food, it was cloudy. Anatoly dismissed the clouds, thinking that there was nothing likely to come of it. How wrong he was. Out of nowhere, it began to snow. First came down like the stereotypical pictures of Winter Wonderland. Then it came down harder and harder and harder. Eventually, Anatoly was lost. He struggled through the storm, clutching his rucksack close to him, but was unable to find any landmark. The minutes wore on, became hours, and he increasingly lost the will to continue. Perhaps, perhaps it would just be better to give in. Just as Anatoly was about to collapse, a mysterious figure appeared in front of him. Its voice concerned, it ushered him to a house that had slowly emerged out of the snow as he walked around it, or towards it. Warmed up with a cup of coffee or a cup of soup in his hands, Anatoly shook his head and looked at the figure most closely. <coughs> Excuse me, more clearly, closely. Wait a thrice darn moment. That wasn't human. It was a talking horse pony. It said something. Said some talking horse was sent out for a meal for him and his guest. Anatoly said, was spinning. Wait a moment. He knew that face from somewhere. Was it Bukharin? Nikolai Ivanovich? Bukharin turned once more, smiled, and did a mock bow. That's covered in the flesh. Convince anew. But I cannot rely just on the old communist pals, can I? No, I need wonderful new friends. I need every pony working together to create a fantastic new future for Russia. With all people's working together, anything is possible. That's the power of harmony, after all. I'll gallop to each village in the Far East to try to convince as many people as I can to embrace my new message of friendship and community. Well, many will be distracted by my new visage and skeptical that their problems can be resolved by banal platitudes about teamwork. I know I can win them over. I'll convince them that this is not just my story, but theirs as well. With love. Alexei Rykov scanned through the contents of the letter in front of him, endlessly. Joy he had not known since what felt like an eternity course through his veins when the letter had first arrived. After all, it was a letter from his old friend Buk or Bukharin, whom he had not heard of in decades. Yet, as he kept reading it through, a sense of eeriness descended upon him as a bizarre discrepancy revealed itself. The name Bukharin was spelled Bukharin, and both the letter's address and sign off, an unintended mistake it could very possibly be. But Rakov couldn't fathom the idea that the paramount leader of the USSR could somehow misspell his very own name twice, no matter how, he toll the how heavy the toll age takes on him could be. Was this also some sort of twisted joke? A cruel mockery of an old man who desire to reconnect with a long-lost friend? No, 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 it couldn't possibly be. The letter described the dearest moments of their friendship as in vivid detail, details only Rykov and Bukharin could know. He sat on his couch, veering on the edge of tears. The day had passed since the letter's arrival, but poor Rykov remained ever confused. All of a sudden, the faintest sound of thumping could be heard from the front door. Rykov hesitantly approached the door, wondering who could be the person making such a ruckus at this late an hour. Was it... The knocking he had jumped to hear once again, the anticipated arrival of his elusive comrade. He crept the door slightly open, getting a glance at the indecipherable silhouette standing behind it. He opened the door further. Suddenly, he recoiled back to his shock and utter horror he was stood in front of him, despite having the distinguishable facial features of his old friend Nikolai Bukharin. He was not human, but rather it was he, or <clears throat> it was a pony. What's wrong, Rykov? You look like you've seen a ghost. And the first all points Congress. Somehow, some way, I've done it. I've assembled a large group of people who believe in me and in the vision of the future that I've envisioned. I finally have enough people to begin working towards bringing harmony to the Russian anarchy. However, friendly conversations and long trots through the snow can only do so much. How many structures and institutions let me carry out my vision for Russia? It's time that I call for the formation of the new governing body, the first All Ponies Congress of the Harmonious Union. It's a lofty name for a lofty dream, and we'll use need and we'll need work hard to live up to this title. Use of crystals, utilization of the pony crystals, nice. Daily pickle power game, not bad. Daily uh, time support, the address. They arrived from across Russia to Amalon. Some had given up years of service for Yagoda. Others had traversed from as far as Svetlovsk. They had given up families and homes and careers for the delusional hope that Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars Nikolai Bukharin had returned to the Union. And Bukharin had turned out to be some kind of deformed horse. Comrade shouted the four-legged beast. His bedinovka crooked over what appears to be harm. The revolutionary ideals cannot end at the state. Overcoming capitalist predation means embodying Marx's ideals in our everyday lives and our relationships. We must be vanguards in a revolution of friendship. There was silence across the room as one of the one time Soviet leader finished, then in a harsh whisper, one of the communist travelers whispered, This this can't possibly be serious, can it? There was another pause. I don't know, Elena. Engels did write about the bourgeois and the proletarian household. I suppose it's sensible for us to be aware of exploitation in all human relate. And friendship? You hear the talking horse about friendship, correct? Elena Panova looked around the room, alarmed at the number of people nodding along and echoing the horse's points. We're sure that thing is Nikolai Bukharin? A companion shrugged. He could be a little green man for all I care. I've never been one to follow the crowd, but if he has ideas on how to save the Soviet Union, he watches a horse man mi mingled with his audiences. I'm willing to give him a chance. What, a talking horse? Uh, is there anything we want to do here? It's been a while since I played TNO at the time of this recording, so... 
Uh, production needs would be pretty nice, but we have enough for now. Getting action, yeah, it'd be good to get that one. Mm, that's pretty good too, but. Infrastructure? Um, you know what? Grab one. We'll see what we can do. If we get another production unit, I'll be happy with that. As this coffee's still pretty darn hot. At least we get some growth. Of course, there's not very much growth, and even then, we don't have very much GDP, so there's not much we can do. But hey, at least we get more research facilities, right? I love this portrait so much. It's so good. It's just so good. Who do we have here? Raikov, Alexei Raikov. We have Ponya Zemchozina. I know I said that completely wrong. We have Mikhail Tomsky. Ah, oh, Mikhail. You're on a pony. And Bloichker. Nice. I like that a lot. The Aquinological Congress, the first of all opponents Congress, the phrase still made Elena yearn for death, was held in Ambalon in a small squat building that doubled as a rest station for ranger herders. Ever so often, one of them would stumble in from the cold to see the bright pink banners and immediately turn around. Sending among throngs of other Russian delegates, Elena wondered if they had the right idea. Big General Day, come, that's a voice, so Elena turned only be shocked by the sight of Bukharin, or Bukharin? It was brown, standing far out about four feet tall, and eyes so enormous that Elena could almost see the room reflected in them. She stifled a groan. Yeah, she said with all the politeness she could muster, she could not believe she was here. She could not believe that she'd abandoned Comrade Yagoda at the mere hint that Bukharin still lived. I suppose all of us were interested in learning about Harman, he said Bukharin, or Bukharin, the once esteemed communist leader turned horse. His tail switched back and forth. Indeed, the motherland has been listless these past few years, carved up by despots and madmen. Only true radical thought can save it. Only by embracing the power of friendship can we save the Soviet Union. Elena's eyes swiveled back toward the door, to the freezing cold outside. It'd be so easy to run away now, to disappear back among you go to staff, or to throw it all away and become a reindeer herder, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. Uh, as deranged as this talking animal and his talk of friendship was, it at least offered the slim possibility of success. Elena let loose a sign, pain sigh. We're all eager to hear your new theories, Buck Haran. Ooh, army professionals begin to improve. Ooh, we'll get some divisions. Human volunteers, nice. Rifles for hands. The council's inaugural session. Ooh, admin efficiency is so good too. Converted to the culture of harmony. Ooh. Only ponies in charge? Admit the holdouts. Expanding crystal mining. Ooh. Let's go with the uh, council's inaugural session. Well, the first all ponies congress, the harmonious union that forms the town that we call for its first ever session. That's a big step for the relatively small collection of friends we've cultivated, and there's no doubt this meeting will be an interesting one. After all, the Congress will have its first meeting led by opponent. That's not a slight sight you see every day. Or any day, really. We can only hope that the meeting goes well. Anything here? Oh, what the heck? Crystals. Monthly games plus ten. <clears throat> it was in the wasteland of the Far East that Bakharin first found the medium by which the forces of harmony may be shared with the world. The magic crystals found deep beneath the earth allows us to manifest our friendship in the physical world, allowing us to perform incredible feats without even lifting a hoof. Okay, so no longer available once we reach the regional stage. Study magic crystals. Ooh, research speed. Oh, do we have something here? Oh, utilization. Nice. So we have Harmonious Society. First, ooh, that's nice. Yeah, that's pretty good. Out of that new pink army. We believe in harmonic communism and the unity and equality of all creatures, but this does not mean we're naive or past face. Chaos, the eternal enemy of harmony, thrives in ruins of the old union, and when agents of chaos turn their backs on friendship, they will be met with bayonets. We'll create a new army, the modern army, an army composed of both humans and ponies, united under the pink banner of harmony. No foe will be go undefeated, and no friend will be undefended. <clears throat> Construction methods, last factory output. This is really cool. Increase human pony conversion rates. What is this? Weakening power. Magic is a delicate thing. Uh, and it's not exactly a straightforward method. We have no doubts that the utilization of this magical resource will not be perfect and that setbacks are going to occur due to the natural unpredictability of the magic's elements magic. Iron a bonus acquired from the crystals will weaken. That sucks. These just be wouldn't be bad. I do want to hurt a cons output too much. Um, how many do we have every month? <clears throat> Feed the people. Less output. Less need to get some goods. Uh, we'll wait. I want to wait. I'll get more stuff. Uh, for a pontif... Pontification. Oh. Oh, no tomato. Oh, what? We have treasure? Do we actually have treasure here? Um, tribute paid? I mean, we might as well... We have literally no divisions, right? Yeah. Fine. That sucks. Our last chance. It was as close as pandemonium in the hall as possible. On one half sat humans, Russians, veterans of innumerable conflicts and hardships, still covered in the scarves from bullets, bayonets, bomb shields, and every other human me method humanity had, had inflicting cruelty on its own kind. They shouted and yelled when they saw the half of the assembly, demanding that the farcical council they were being subjected to cease immediately. <clears throat> on the other hand, 
Sitting on their back ends, despite having four hooves, were an assortment of brightly colored ponies of all varieties. The two were shouting, though somehow it seemed less aggressive, insisting that the way forward was by accepting the aid and ideals of the ponies and bringing an army to Russia by accepting pontification as they had had. In the middle of this roaring crowd stood a tired looking chestnut colored pony. For a moment, the despair took over him, or overtook him, and the shouting and yelling faded away into the background and as his eyes glazed over and his mind cast back to those terrible days when the unit had first fallen. His union. They didn't remember what he had seen, what he had felt when he assumed this new form. The pain melted away like snowflakes in the sunlight, and the vital energy they had brought him to power in Moscow for the first time returned. He would not fail now, commanding the will to make miracles happen. This horn glow with powers, he magically amplified his voice and turned to face the gathering. Comrades, the time was long past for arguing and squabbling. We lost that ride long ago when the bombs first fell, when the steel and bloodlust of the Germans shattered all we had thought, fought so hard to build. Now we have another chance. Perhaps the last one. Like a miracle, we've been handed powers almost from a fairy tale. And all it takes to use them is a will to unite the dream of friendship. Believe it or not, my friends, but it is true. Friendship is magic. And this would be the magic that finally saves Russia, perhaps the whole world. The hall fell silent. Well, then one by one, the human stood and saluted. It didn't matter if it was one called B Buharin or Bukharin or nothing at all. He was their leader and a miracle he'd return to them. All that is left is to believe. <clears throat> Let's at least get a few divisions. The f physical differences between ponies and humans would make grouping them in the same unit in inadvisable instead. For our new pony volunteers, we should create the pony brigades. These soldiers will be the elite backbone of the pink army and will be able to move faster and ar fight harder than any of their human contemporaries. We get equal and rifles, huh? So three divisions, but it's better than nothing. How many do we have? 85? Not bad. Up army recruitment. Feed the people. I want more output. That's the first one we're going to get. New pink army. Planification. The new army. Nikolai Bukharin really hated this? No, really. Conflict with the wider world was certainly at this rate. It was to be expected when the wider world announced to three or more different types of imperialists. Some kind of would-be emperor from the farthest Oceania, a guy that thought Russians were somehow master race, and a guy who worshipped pragmatism as if it was a god. Damien Nikolai had to like it. <clears throat> the world's problems could be solved easily if people just sat down and talked with one another for once. It worked well enough for Nikolai to reestablish order in the Northwest, after, after all, but alas, sometimes people were simply unwilling to talk. So we'll have no other choice. Bakar signed the decree, and had it sent to the political bureau for the signatures. They agreed on it and sent it back to him, at which point he ordered it disseminated. The next day, the people of the Harmonious Union, humans and ponies alike, awoke to messages indicating the creation of the armed forces of the Harmonious Union, or as it would be called more colloquially, the New Pink Army. Mm, communism. Spreading the word a utopian ideal. I kind of want to get all that stuff. Interspecies relations or cooperation. More attack is nice. Ooh, I want more armor professionalism. What is this over here? Anything here? More centralized. More weekly game by month. Alternative uses. Ooh, get research though. Um, I want expanding the cro uh, crystal mines. There's one miraculous object that lies at the heart of our recreation of society: crystals. There was a time when no living creature on this planet knew the deposit of this precious object that dot the landscape of northern Siberia. With well, the coming of a brave leader, Bukharin, so too came the availability, or the ability to find these countless crystal veins, just waiting to be extracted and put to work and shape in the new world he envisions. However, we must first consolidate what we already have on a hoof. All of our current crystals come from a single site, which holds much more potential than we are getting out of it right now. It must be expanded as the All Points Congress has ordered. First drill. After the drill instructor had completed his customary walk through the two rows of necks of new recruits, standing sharply at attention, he was uncharacteristically speechless. Normally at this point, he would begin isolating those that were weak, vacillating, 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 or otherwise seem unsure of what they were doing and gave them an enemy to hate and a reason to be motivated. <clears throat> However, how are we supposed to do such a thing with talking past the horses for all he knew? They might be trampled on him. If the shouting got too loud, finally stop, he stopped overthinking, roared obscenities at them all, and together they marched to the playground, the area where the physical abilities would be tested. At least here it would be a familiar ground. First were the unicorns. They lost their breath running around the field within ten minutes, but when it came time to test their marksmanship, they almost all cracked shots. More importantly, they'd held the guns aloft with glowing magic, which they could also use to lift heavy equipment. Bought themselves with a climbing wall and a whole host of other things. As they carried on, the drill instructor noted every detail, detail observed and began mentally drafting the combat roles they'd be perfect for. Next were the Pegasi. With wings running around the course was irrelevant, so instead he did the most promising unicorn and levitate several hoops, and made them fly increasingly complex or complicated maneuvers, and they collapsed with exhaustion, living planes perfect for paratroopers carrying supplies to the front and recon. Finally came the bulk of the recruits who had been waiting nervously and watching. Earth ponies, no special abilities that were immediately apparent, but clearly built differently as they continued marching, climbing, digging, and training continuously, with no breaks until the sun began to set and all they could do was do more. They sat back in his office, enjoying the quiet moments that once the day's training had concluded, the drill instructor realized that he had been given the perfect material to make an army with, and by God he would make the best darn army either the world has, even, has ever seen. And I appreciate that he would capitalize the G in God. Pavel? 
It was Ildoni. Nice. Very nice. Now if anyone wants to try to attack us, we'll be fine, right? We'll be fine. So if we don't do anything for the first couple of days, do we get penalized? Hopefully not. Search new crystals? Or sources. Now the city of crystals enters our warehouses and caches on a daily basis, it's time to look into expanding the requisitioning of these inter integral gems. Some of the engineers that have stumbled upon recent or nascent in civilization of magic crack or craft devices out of crystals able to track down new veins. All these devices require some someone or some pony to carry them through the harsh forest, hills, and tundra of the Siberian expanse. So while the All Ponies Congress commissioned the crystal, crystal tracking divisions, the small groups that composed of the most experienced hunters and trackers the North has yet to offer, to be sent out of the desolation of Siberia to locate crystals and call on mining teams to begin excavation. We need these resources to weather the coming storm. It's excellent. Some workers to mines? Why not? <clears throat> I want to get that monthly game by 20. With the creation and expansion of crystal mines well underway, our foremen were tasked with figuring out how to streamline the excavation sites as much as possible. After trying nearly every other potential situation or solution, they have unanimously reported the greatest choke point in the relocation of crystalline material is simply the amount of pony power assigned to the chain of production. They don't have enough. Thankfully, we do not lack points with available hooves, as it is absolutely critical that we have as many crystals as possible. As soon as possible, we must reallocate the many ponies and jobs demanded or deemed less important to the mines. These crystals, our brethren suffering to the south, shall be free to work comrades. Magical friendship and the sparkling bounty. The sounds of metal striking crystal and work boots clinking against the crystalline floors filled the mines, creating a strangely intimate environment, all alien though they were to Val's ears. As he surveyed the newly created chamber, from which crystal returns were even higher than in other parts of the mining complex, he heard a new sound. The louder click of hooves and the crystal that signaled an unequipped pony walking up to the side. How goes excavation, Pavel? Vladimir asked. Coming to a stop at Pavel's shoulder. The Congress wants and needs this to go smoothly. Vladimir had been a childhood friend of Pavel's, and now he was one of the top-ranking ponies working in the mines. The two got to collaborate extensively on the job, while Pavel couldn't say that he thought that ponification was wholly normal yet. His friend was still his friend, no matter what form he took. Things are coming along well. There's certainly some points of production that can still be improved, but overall, I suspect that the Congress will find what we've done here sufficient. With that, the friends turned back to the sprawling mass of ponies and humans before them, all contributing in a way suited to the talents. Humans worked to the walls, slowly extracting the crystals for the ponies to move out of the floor. Watching over this were the unicorns able to manipulate the very rocks around them with their minds. No one could argue with having bosses that actually made your job easier. Also, it was enshrined in the queer, sparkling light cast by industrial lighting, reflecting off of the crystals that shone through the room. Turns out, friendship is good for more than just magic. Searching at the end of the world, dawn broke with a whisper. The sun's rays rolling over the frozen lands like honey being spread over bread. They flowed through the valleys along the rivers or along around the trees and finally into the small camp, one of society's farthest outposts at the very edges of the world. Sonia woke to the sound of wood being chopped. The day had already begun, and she was still bundled up tight in her tent. After quickly preparing for the day, she exited her tent and was greeted by the glare of the sunlight on freshly fallen snow. She marveled at the feeling of snow on her hooves, a strange but not entirely uncomfortable touch that felt soft, cool, and refreshing. Sonia had only chosen to be ponified right before she departed for the sake of her division. An equal balance of ponies and humans, the ideal formation of exploring the Siberian wilderness. Her commander walked up to her, their mission held in his hands. They had been given three devices that could direct one of the locations of the crystals, much like the divining rods of old. On any other day, the crystals held in these devices gave out a slight glimmer, mostly unnoticeable in the light of day. However, what her commander held in his hands was glowing brightly and showing, showering his body in sloth purple light. Sonia, I'm glad you're awake. He was, his smile was genuine, but tired. It turns out what we happened across, what we've been looking for without even knowing it. It seems that this campsite is directly above the crystal deposit. Sonia rejoiced internally for a moment, but quickly realized something was off. The crystal detector should have been blaring yesterday, but they only given us somewhat more light than last night. Them not detecting anything would indicate the crystals nearby were covered. Then she saw him, and all came together. Draped across the makeshift bed next to the partially dug ditch lay her friend, Yakov. Unlike last time she'd seen him, he was now a fellow pony. The wilds of Sabir strike another unsuspecting soul. And also, we have, we can we, we get we can crystal power up. It's stock up to 400 now, but I got a few buffs. Not much, but a few buffs. And then, of course, we're sending workers to the mines. I kind of want to do this one, but I don't want to lose any more crystals. Oh, uh, this one to get more every month. Decrease crystal maximum storage by 50. Become more centralized. Temporary workers. Beyond the blinds. Alternative uses. Offer ponification. I'll keep going on this way. I'll go this way, probably. Defining harmony. We get more political power. Offer bonification. Buck Haram will be offering something very special to the people of Russia. After experiencing what those miraculous crystals could do, it became clear to him what we must do. We must spread this gift to the rest of Russia. We must give the people a chance to share their mortal forms and ascend to the forms of ponies instead, to abandon the dreary world of pain and hate, and embrace the magical future that lies ahead of them to show them the true power of friendship. A different breed of workers. 
The rumbling of engines and plumes of dust filled the early morning air. Pulling, trucks pulling out of the yard and onto the road piled high with mining equipment and the men and women who were using it. Well, men and... Men, women, and ponies. That last group was more than a little off put in Maxime, who had already been working in the mines of Siberia for most of his life. He already felt overwhelmed by the integration of ponies into everyday society. Now, he had learned of his first job under the new Northwestern government. Siberian government, of course. Was to work in a newly discovered crystal mine alongside three, these ponies. Thus, he found himself squeezed between two strange creatures after hop hopping in a truck destined for the mines. As the truck began rattling along the dirt roads, it was quiet as a tomb. The only sounds made by the vehicle and the occasional shuffling of men and ponies. Eventually, the sounds was broken by one of the younger men, who did to work on large-scale projects like this. He raised a hand of technique, or question of technique, which Maxime was well-versed in, but as he opened his mouth to answer the pony beside him, spoke up. It turns out that he had misjudged the ponies, both in age and experience. The one to his right was an old hand in the business and had volunteered to be ponified to help the streamlining of inner species operation. This one to his left was a veteran of the Second West Russian War, and after being put on the being one of the first turn, he was one of the few security person ponyel tasked this project. For all the oddities that Maxime still couldn't get over, it was human and ponyizing. To hear the stories and mentor the younger amongst the group leader. By the time they arrived at the mine, Maxime was starting to see the ponies in a different light. Maybe we can all get along after all. Only ponies in charge? Admit the holdouts? I do want to admit the holdouts, but I don't want to do political power. Only ponies in charge. I want to do it on so badly. Only poems can truly grasp what it means to be in harmony. Only poems can even understand the concept of harmony, and only they can see it fulfilled to its fullest extent. Despite these already established facts, many positions of power in the land under our administration remain in the hands of humans. That's of course unacceptable, for our nation can only prosper if it follows the tenets of harmony. As such, all administrative positions are to be granted only to ponies and ponies alone. While all humans currently inhabited, our habitating said positions will be removed from, effective, removed from them effective immediately. Let's sake of our collective prosperity. Defining harmony. The next item for the Congress to discuss is an important foundational concern. What exactly is harmony? What are its tenets? What are its goals? When you fight for harmony, what well, what is it you're fighting for? Comrade Bukharin has ideas in this regard, but he hasn't set yet down to codify the exact ideas at play here. The Congress will begin defining harmony as an ideal so that we can move toward forward under its banner. How many do we have right now? Twenty one? Not much. That's fine. More power grids, let's get uh, power grids would actually be pretty good, probably. Let's do that one. A new form. Magic shone like nothing else in this world, glittering and glistening like something alive. The turquoise rays danced across Gregory's face as he stared deep into the crystal. Next to him stood a pony, once a human just like himself. The thought could not escape his mind that he was about to make the worst mistake of his life. They would experience some kind of horrific nightmare as his flesh melted and reconfigured and irreversibly disfigured itself. The pony laughed. I wouldn't tell you that it doesn't hurt, but that I got used to this almost instantly. But to be honest, does it even matter? How much did you achieve as a human? The loss of the communist movement, the loss of Russia, the loss of your home, the loss of whatever scraps were left. We have a chance, man. We must make the sacrifice once more, this time before our human form. But the dream survives of a world founded on peace and harmony, of all beings working towards a common goal of progress. Free from the death grip of greed, this magic gives us the power to fight one final time, a new body perhaps, but with a strength, speed, and gifts you've never had as a human. What do you say? Gregory held the crystal, feeling its cool, smooth hardness against the rough calluses of his palm. He fought needlessly from Poland to Ukraine to Moscow, always retreating and retreating into the furthest corners that he could be that could be reached. Years of shelling and malnutrition had sapped whatever strength remained in his human frame, and now as a hunched over shell, he attended Bakharin's council as a representative of what little remained of the Russia of old. And the deep, pur deep purple of the crystal, almost mocking him, this, the reflection of a drained man stared back into his eyes. He made up his mind. The reflection vanished as the brilliant sparks of energy shot from the crystal and great veins first into his heart, then spreading to every part of his body in an instant it was done. Magic surged to his new horns as he felt new strength in his legs. It took a little getting used to, but already the future seemed brighter. All across Russia, the song of rebirth plays once more. Defining Harmony, of course, is next. Spreading the word. Oh, yes. Actually, nice. He took an idea. I want to get as much political power as possible. As much as I want to do army professionalism, still. Only ponies in charge, my friends. I know I'm quite discriminatory, but it is what it is, and it's for a good reason. Right, Nikolai? That's right. <clears throat> An argument. Are you mad? Do you want me to give up my humanity, the last effing thing I have on this earth, after the Germans took everything? No one's asking you to give up every or anything. Instead, embrace the future. Comrade, this magic is what will finally bring back Russia. No, the entire movement back. In front of a large purple crystal, a pony and a human shouted loud. An old woman walked past, it registering emotionlessly how absurd the scene was. The light from the dull crystal almost seemed to get brighter and duller with every raised voice and impassioned argument. Perhaps what was being argued was nonsense, but the nature of man never seemed to change, even if the form did. She left them behind, and their voices grew quieter and quieter. You know better than us, than the, or no better than the whites, than the Germans. Reactionaries clinging to the past, and ex at the expense of... Clinging to the past? That's what you call not wanting to turn into a horse? For a while, they simply stared at each other, all shouting exhausted. There was nothing more that could be said. 
No words could cross the gap. Even if they had been discussing and did not involve magically transforming into a small colored pony, this would still have been the result one way or another. How far can a man walk before he must stop? Utopian ideal. Harmony, when you think about it, is perfect. A peaceful society championing cooperation and friendship between all peoples with no hatred is acceptable for all peoples. Our people should want such a great thing, but they will never do so unless they are really shown the ins and outs of it. Now that we have a bit more codified, it's time to show all the people within our borders how fantastic friendship and harmony is. Defining harmony. So on the basis of workers' expression, free harmonic councils electing representatives who come together in the spirit of brotherhood and friendship to exercise supreme legislative power. <laughs> what nonsense! Without a friendship vanguard supreme over all others, the security and the unity of purpose of the new state cannot be guaranteed. Friendship vanguard. So the butchers and tyrants will call themselves our best friends now before they fire the killing shot. As the smoke of endless cigarettes swirled around his head and blocked out the already dim light bulb, Bakaran thought wearily how some people never seemed to tire to speculate endlessly how society ought to be ordered, down to every last detail before they had even lifted their hindquarters out of their chairs. Gentlemen and ponies, we are missing the point. Harmony does not refer to how society is ordered, it refers as to why it is ordered. Rather than exploiting our fellow beings, we can work with them, with the knowledge and trust that they work with us too. Several heads of different tops to looked at each other, confused. Sure, this is just the end goal of communism itself. What does harmony add to this equation? For a moment, Bakarin had no answer. It was a good question. Then it began, from the very beginning. Our means, method, and end must be friendship. When we reach out to the public, we may seek to generally befriend them, one by one, and only then ask in the spirit of camaraderie, humility, if they wish to help us in the creation of this new society. Forget workers' councils, or the vanguard party, or anything else. Our fundamental units are drinks shared after work. Birthday parties, shoulders a thump when you cry, laughing, and hold when you are simply crying. Even if they lack our ideological convictions, friendship comes first, that's what I mean. The rest can come later. Now go out, come, come make, go make some new friends. Dismissed. This one, I think we can wait for this one. So, I want to believe, so let's wait, because we, we want to go there eventually, but we'll get there. Um, hmm, I do want to get extra daily stuff, as much as I want to do that one, like I said. It, it makes more sense to go this one, I think, but delay labor organization. It's the unfortunate truth that we need the magical crystals from the mounts more than anything else. And if we're to be busy with things such as labor organization, our crystal production may tank. Someday we'll have all the crystals we want, and we'll be able to organize a proletariat. Create a social state, whatever else we fancy. Until then, the workers will have to wait. Crystals must regrettably be our priority. Less storage, that's okay. You know, we all have to make sacrifices here, so... It is what it is. Oh, more stuff in here. Industrial investments are probably what we're going to do next again, so... Ideal. A little boy and a little girl ran around in a uh, <clears throat> small village someplace in the Russian anarchy. They had not been as energetic as this in a good long time, it was true. But today was a time for energy and for a sure, felt, a sure fate of happiness. Why, then you ask? Why, they would be able to express themselves very well if you asked them, but it was rather simple. Because their parents were happy for the first time in a long time. No more were their faces long with sadness, nor their brows furrowed with worry. They were more cheerful than they had been for as far back as their kids could remember, actually. There were other reasons to be happy, too. They're eating food again like normal people who were supposed to. They hadn't gone to sleep hungry last night, nor the days before. The little boy and girl were simply too young to understand what was happening. If one were to ask them about ponies, they would only speak of small horses and books, but they were happy nonetheless. They kept gambling about, as all children should. Gambling. Uh, construction speed, output... Uh... Kind of like that one. Need to get some good goes down, but whatever. Alternative uses. Crystals, crystals, crystals. They already do so much. They transform us into these incredible stallion forms far stronger than ever before. They give us magical powers. Powers which humanity has begged for millennia. Yeah, there must be more. Our scientists must look further into the crystals, discover their every facet, in order to be certain that we've truly tapped their power. Only once we've uncovered the true power of those crystals can we empower a world of harmony. Temporary workers. Uh, let's see, let's get 75 here. Another production unit. Most mornings, the overseer preferred to spend the day with coffee and newspaper. Today was different, though. His workers began to protest, so he needed to remember who was the boss around here, even if it meant training a new crew in the cold of Siberia far from the warmth of his office. The crew only needed a few hours of preparation. Frankly, the work was more of a brain than a brawl. Especially given the bright glimmer of the crystals, the only hiccup was morale. With protests raging in the center of the mining encampment, there was no way to avoid the nature of the work. The overseer could only call these men temporary workers for so long, and these men were scabs, and the protests raging, they certainly knew it. By the time the new crew was ready to enter the mines, most well, accepted the place. Only one nervous worker stayed behind, suddenly struck with a pang of guilt and a brief moment of defiance. He turned to his boss, what stopped us from joining the protesters. Confused, the overseer took a moment to answer. Nothing really, though. They probably hate you for the scab work. I just, I'll just i just find some more workers. Up north, there's a lot of you, not many of me. Remember that before you ask another stupid question. The stallion stared at his new boss in disbelief. The overseer simply pointed at the mine shift. Now get to work. Or office for hooves. The pony brigade may be low and true to our cause, but without rifles, they have limited combat effectiveness. We must begin to produce weapons so the brigades may demonstrate the righteousness of the harmonic communism to those who do not yet believe. Some party members have expressed concern that opponents cannot hold rifles, but they'll soon discover through the power of friendship anything is, of course. 
possible. Equine. Oh, we have equine stuff. Whoops, forgot about that. Yeah, you don't even need to oh, crap. We've been building the wrong stuff the entire time. I don't expect a visitor. Well, Circle's not sure why Yvonne had been decided to rent a village barn two villages north of Cold as heck. was a perfect place to stay around with a magical crystal. It certainly wasn't sterile, as it was an extreme, annoyingly long drive away from Sergei's home. At least Luxu brought vodka, and lots of it, so they could at least have some fun while they contracted frostbite. I'm gonna shoot it with my gun, said Yvonne, as he stumbled about, flashing, fishing for a pistol in his back pocket. Yeah, wait, what? Sergei barely attempted to question what was happening as a gunshot rang out and a bright flash illuminated the barn. When Sergei could see again, he saw the crystal go was gone. And this place was not was appeared to be a floating, glowing ring. The ring acted as a window, showing a view of an entirely different setting from the small barn the group of scientists sat in. Uh, then a thing flew, th flew through the portal. It was shaped like an orb with two pairs of wings and four legs and a large compound eyes like an insect, and the glowing ring disappeared with a small plop sound. After several minutes of screaming, crying, and drunken shooting, Alexei managed to get it trapped in the creative vodka they'd emptied out. Yvonne summed up everyone's thoughts pretty succinctly once they had all calmed down. What the F was that? I don't know, but whatever it is, enough for Mirth, replied Sergei. All he knew was that they definitely had to try this again back home, in the lab. Maybe Karen Bakharin will like it. Human volunteers? Yes. It turns out that a great deal of humans are interested in the ponies, even fascinated by them. Primarily young men, outcast of society, these figures even go as far as ranking their favorite ponies and wearing clothes that demonstrate their support for pony kind. These men may not be the cream of the crop, but they are fit for the battlefield. We should teach them how to hold a weapon, we should teach them the tenets of Arctic warfare. We'll train them in matters of hygiene and fitness soon. These humans will be fit to join the Harmonious Union, and you will be that much stronger for it. Which is a good thing. So what's going to be weakened here? Ooh, construction speed went down. Ah, new consumer is good, went down. Defying all explanation. And there you go. More up up. The bespeckled man sighed heavily before looking up from his clipboard, so comrade blanket, could you please pick up that pen on the desk in front of you? The pony named Blanket, who had been picking up things for close to six hours by this point, sighed as well. Despite her exasperation, she picked up a pen. How? I don't even have enough fingers. This should be impossible. Blanket put the pen down. One of the scientists was curled up on the on lab floor, sobbing about something involving his PhD in physics. That wasn't even the worst breakdown she had seen in the last hour. Comrade Blanket, how? how what? How? I'm sorry, Cameron, I really don't know how it works. I just pick up things without really thinking about it, and it just happens. She replied a line she had already memorized five hours ago. Less explanation not satisfy the scientists. One man snapped his clipboard over his knee and left the room. She sighed as another group of scientists rushed into the room, asking why everyone was freaking out so much. She knew that she was going to be here all night. Can you pick up those pencil, this pencil again, but this time, think about it? Rifles for hands. Guns for ponies? That's a difficult question. Guns for humans, on the other hand, are simple. Humans make up half our population, and the same is true with the armed forces. They also have fingers and thumbs. With all previously existing designs for the guns entirely designed around this fact. Producing guns for humans can be an easy backup, besides pony weaponry. How ponies are capable of holding objects with their hands is something we dare not try to explain. Nevertheless, we must produce guns for humans. It's probably a good thing, too. Hey. The human volunteers. Armies are not usually characterized by the ready acceptance of differences and understanding towards laggards, and the Army of Harmony, being assembled by Buck Harm's state, was no different. At first, the new equine instructor of the 5th Revolution of Brigade, Mix, almost gave up entirely and requested that either his human recruits take Buck Harm's offer and become ponies, or join a human brigade and stop embarrassing themselves trying to compete with the indefatigable earth ponies of the flying pecos the magical unicorns. But then he waited and watched. Even as the ponies laughed, the humans marched on. They had been determined to keep their form, and they could not let them, let them hold them back. Slowly, bit by bit. The humans first began catching up to the earth ponies, but then matching their pace. They could not. When they could not, they still ran until they collapsed, and then their comrades stopped and carried them to the finish line. Finally struck the ponies, their goal was not just to join the army and become a purely military unit. It was to become a unit of harmony, and if these men were not following its ideals in the truest sense, then who was? Then they realized their fall, and after apologizing, they began competing twice as hard, watching over the ponies, peoples of two species, exerting themselves in friendly competition, but... Watching off each other's backs, the instructor realized what a truly magical brigade he had 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 the good fortune to be training. The harmony, the army of harmony, takes shape. Hmm. Oh, go external investments. Why not? Invest. Wow, that's not very good. Now we get more investment. That's better. Yeah, that makes it feel better. Interspecies cooperation. Harmony leagues beyond human comprehension with its magical. In both the figurative and literal senses of the word, allured, undecipherable to them, nevertheless, interspecies cooperation remains a core tenet of harmony. And as the specter of fascism continues to linger near us, this necessity of pony human cooperation in the face of reactionary aggression grows ever more vital. 
After all, how can a society claim to be one with harmony if its people that can constitute it do not live together harmoniously? Scrap together. This is Giselle. Art to me, tired, mutteredly, or tiredly muttered. The first he had spoken since uh, training or started. Since started. Since starting. Daniel blinked, realizing he was the only one within earshot, and nonchalantly leaned closer to his compatriot to respond. Uh, what? The two soldiers have been sent to collect uh, to weapons being donated to the army. Producing weaponry was a challenge in the Siberian way, so scrounging up any existing weapons wasn't a bad idea, surely. This logic lasted right up until I saw the actual armaments of the villagers that he had gotten together. What armaments they were. Among the Molly crew of guns, it was an extremely rusty PPSH that I immediately split into two upon inspection, and was in a gun with both barrels and a stock sawn off. Which wasn't so bad until you realized whoever had done it had a shoddy job and left a sharp torn barrel and a splintery stock for the user, multiple disused Fedorov Atovomats. Surely from the 20th Civil War, an RPD, no sorry, an AK-47, which has multiple bits of wood and metal, nailed and welded to it and sort of looked like an RPD, and then the prize of the piece was a long wooden rifle that Artemy was holding and called a Giselle. Afghani tribes have been using them against the British. It's a darn musket, Artemy. Uh, sp tersely spoke as he scanned the broomstick handle dressed as a gun. Daniel nervously rubbed at the back of his neck under the driven eyes of the villagers, trying to find a pos uh, posture, a positive. Well, does it, mm, does it shoot? Daniel's question caused Artemy to pause in examination, then proceeding to grab up the ammo, gunpowder, and a ball, and load the weapon. Without warning, he took aim at a nearby tree and fire, and it did so with a large black puff of smoke and a thunder crack. As the smoke cleared, it was clear that it hit the target dead on. Artemy took a deep breath and turned to the face of the villagers. We'll take him. The first trial. In our journey to bring about a revolution of harmony in this broken land of Russia, we need one thing above all, a strong, competent land force to defend against the various enemies of harmony throughout the world. Recently, we've managed to assemble a force of troops devoted to a cause. However, one large question mark is whether they are any good. For, for us, we have an easy testing sample we can deploy our troops against. A lot of bog-standard bandits running wild, looting all over the north of the Far East. Let's send in the army of harmony and give them a proper baptism of fire, using experience gained for the future fights to bring about the harmonious wonder union. Yeah, that sounds like a good thing. How's the economy doing? Real growth. Inflation's all over the place, though. Oh boy. So we already maxed this out too. So nice. The drill. All right, everyone. Said Lieutenant Alina Valukova, whispered across the radio. I want the humans to flank left and the ponies up in the middle. Move out and take the hill. Cadet Genrik nodded in assent. As did the creatures around, human and pony-like. The 5th Revolutionary Brigade was one of the first units of the Pink Army to be made up of both species living in the Union. As such, Genrik felt as if there was duty to prove that harmony could triumph even at war. Moving out, Genrik and the two other ponies, both unicorns, stalking their way through the underbrush. Hearing a rustle ahead, he raised the hoof calling to halt, costly raising the pellet gun into the air. A small ermine shot out of the bushes, chittering in its wake, and the group sighed in relief. A sudden hail of pellets exploded around them, cutting any relief short. The pony Genrik's left was hit, and he moved gently around the lip of a small mound. He raised his head to peek above, but he had to duck to avoid taking a round of the face. We're cut off, he shouted to his mic. We need help. The second voice crackled over the radio just a moment. The storm of pills was cut off by a series of shots and distant bangs, and then then, 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 then silence fell once again. Footsteps crunched through the snow before a human hand was thrust into the dirt, or the ditch. Accepting it, Genrik pulled himself up, giving a nod to the human who just helped him. Good now, let's take the hill, and spreading the word. One of the realities concerning our nascent harmonious union is that it is isolated, to put it charitably. While we've been securing our fledgling state, there aren't very many people outside of it who know about us or what we stand for. It's about time we rectified that. As nobody's going to fight by our side, they don't know what our side is. We'll send people out to spread the word of our movement immediately. But we won't get anywhere if there's next no one prepared to champion it. Man, that's a lot of lag, ain't there? Yes, sir. Political campaigns. That's possible. Oh, academic basically ends to slow and improve. Well, might as well do that one. And the first trial. Load them up, boys, and don't take any women, any of the women you think they're worth it. So crowd the band of captain, pointing an old, worn-out mosin at the cowering man beside him. Or uh, behind him, a man burst into each house, ran to the place for anything that might be of value. The women folk of the village had all huddled in the center palace, holding each other for warmth and uh, support and comfort. Then, from the skies, dropped three ponies with wings, Pegasi launched from the ground like bullets, and sped around the bandits, confusing them, shots rang. From the forest, causing the captain to fit a rage fire a shot at the man he had been aiming at, but before a shot found its mark, he was suspended in mid-air, surrounded by a glowing aura. Magic. With a sound like endless thunder claps, the earth ponies rushed out of the trees, firing accurately at the bandits, just behind them were humans, were the uniform of the harmonious union, charging at the devils with bayonets or helping the villagers escape. It was all over in less than ten minutes. Those bands and not yet immediately dropped to the ground and soiled their pants, rushed back into the forest, dropping everything they had looted in their haste. The villagers were safe, and as they celebrated, hugging the soldiers regards to species, the men and ponies of the harmonic army thought ahead. There would be many more battles, most definitely harder than this, but it was surely their vic first victory. And a beacon in the north. 
After much hard work and dedication, we've done it. The Siberian Waste, which have spent years under no authority whatsoever after the collapse of the Union and the Anarchy, have arisen once more as the face of the new harmonic movement. Few by magic and the power of friendship, our state flourishes as a beacon of harmony in the further north. But not all is well in the Far East, of course. The fascist toil and farce and tragedy are all suns bigger than the Irkutsk and Baratia. I know still skulk in the better cold harmony faces many threats upon its borders, and so it's time for action. I want to believe. I want to believe. What? Artyom's eyes bulged with wide, bulged wide in a bewilderment. A horse, you heard me right. Sashu went to correct himself, well appointed to be precise. It's been years, decades since I heard that name, and now you're telling me that he's back and he's a horse? The barn is empty aside from Artyom and his bartender, Sasha. Everyone else had gone to their stations, working on the grueling hour that they were forced to continue with thanks to the harsh output quotas. Uh, that the fascist government imposed, not Artyomul. He has set on satisfying his curiosity. Why are you pronouncing the way book 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 buck harn? Sasha emphasized, pronouncing it with a hint of English in there. That's what he calls himself. And how are you supposed to know this? Artyom down another shot of vodka. I've overheard the guards talking about it. You know it's real when even the RFPs, uh, conscripts are discussing it. They also talked about how this buck harn is planning to rebel the old Soviet Union of old. God knows if an effing horse can do such a thing. There was a sounding silence following Sasha's remark, led in the howling of those Siberian winds in the dark room. Without another word, Artyom stood up and walked out of the room, leaving Sasha alone in the dark. Artyom arrived at his home, opening the door. He greeted his wife and daughter and continued, Ready to do things, we leave at daybreak. I have a story to tell you, but you're going to have to trust me on this one. We're doing okay on everything, pretty much. 44 is not enough, but... Actually, what do we have here? Is it any good yet, or no? Construction's pretty bad. Oof. But we're making some good units, some good things here. Also, we can eventually get these pony main battle tanks. Which are very strong. Very, very strong. Actually, 14 defense is not that bad. Not, not that great. Look at all that lag. Happy 1963, though, everybody. Because you guys have how much defense? 10? You guys have how much defense? 15. So that's actually quite a bit better. Um. Oh, more factory output. Reconnect Soviet power grids. Oh, look at that. For now, we're just poor. Ah, the second session of the All Ponies Congress. Would you look at that? It was impossible that this was happening. Elena Pol Panova thought. Either she lost her mind or the reactionary mother had been out right along. Heck, was a real place. Ah, oh, Comrade Panova, it's so good to see you between sessions. And Elena closed her eyes. She had a prayer slashed through her brain as she begged for God for anyone to end this. Instead, she opened her eyes to see the creature named Buck Harns clopping towards her. Its bulbous face stretched into a smile. I trust my theories, my contributions to Elena have been to your satisfaction. Elena gazed into the abyss that was the creature's eyes. For weeks, she'd listened to as Bukhar and recited every empty platitudes about friendship. For weeks, she'd watched the creatures uncover materials and weapons that could not exist. The worst part was a transformation. Serious, credible revolutionaries met Bukhar and emerged on all fours. Richter's grins on their faces. Unforgettable, Elena heard herself say. The thing wearing Bukharin's face was laughed. I guess that's as good as a start as any now that we've settled on the revolutionary program. It's super important that we spread the revolution to all peoples of the motherland. With you, I, and the delegates here to unite as friends, we'll spread harmony across Russia. Others must have been listening to the conversation because Elena became aware of the clopping of hooves and clapping of hands. Bukhar and his hellish legions were celebrating. This can't be real. It can't be real. And looking outwards. Nice. Developing an economy early on using crystals. The foundations have been laid. The work has been done. Our society of harmony has been created. But it's only, only one of them. And one of many. If all of Russia is to come together in friendship, we're going to have to start looking beyond the borders and expanding. We'll have a number of neighbors, but the decision has been made that our first stop will be Kamchatka. Home of the remnants of the Pacific Fleet. Let's first take our step, first step onwards. And let's end this episode with a painting, the Red Fleet Pink. We've achieved far first victory in spreading harmony, as Kamchatka and the battered remains of the Pacific Fleet now lie within a grasp. While we work to properly incorporate them into our state, we'll need to take the bigger step of incorporation. Uh, many, more than anything else, our ways are strange to our new brothers and sisters. They understand very little about harmony, so it's up to them to spread the magic of friendship to them. But, I think we'll end it there just because... Please, we could spend more time in the next episode doing this stuff. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we'll continue on with our land of spreading harmony by force. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.